five plus five past ten. So please be patient and get comfortable, and we will start our event shortly.
Good morning, speakers, students, guests, and alumni, and welcome to LSESU Actuarial Society's Actuarial Conference 2020, Breaking the Norm, Bridging the Gap. My name is Stephanie Keja, and I'll be emceeing today's event. Before we begin, I would like to introduce a few house rules for this event. Throughout the conference, please mute yourself. Please feel free to turn on your cameras if you'd like. Today's session will be fully recorded. If you have any questions, please leave them in the chat box and they will be addressed during the Q&A session. You can also contact the LSCSU Actuarial Society email at lscsuact at gmail.com for assistance if you have any accessibility needs. To make the best out of this Zoom conference, we recommend a side-by-side -side speaker view. To change your display to this setting, Click the top right corner on your screen and select the speaker side-by-side -side view, which is the second option from the top. Each year, the LACSU Actuarial Society organizes the largest student-led actuarial conference in the UK. This marks our seventh actuarial conference, and we are honored to have a number of high-profile speakers to share their insights with us. This is the opportunity for students to listen to the speakers on where their careers can go, from the environment to the Good morning, speakers, students, guests, and alumni. And welcome to LSCSU Actuarial Society's Actuarial Conference 2020, Breaking the Norm, Bridging the Gap. My name is Stephanie Keja and I'll be emceeing today's event. Before we begin, I would like to introduce a few house rules for this event. Throughout the conference, please mute yourself and please turn on your cameras if you'd like. And today's session will be fully recorded. If you have any questions, it will be addressed in the Q&A session later. In this first session, we will be discussing our first topic, actuaries as an expanding career. Studies in actuarial science provide to prove to provide versatility. Its application is useful in different disciplines. While a career in the traditional actuarial space is incredibly rewarding, actuaries play a variety of roles in the economy. Today, we will see and explore the varying career options as an actuary the effects of artificial intelligence on our industry, and an opportunity to network and ask valuable questions to our speakers. Today, we will have three speakers' presentations. After each speaker's presentation, there will be a 10-minute individual Q&A session for the speaker. If you have any questions for the speaker, please leave them in the Zoom chat box and I will address them accordingly. Towards the end, we will have a general Q&A session where questions are accepted for all of the speakers. This session is expected to end at 12 p.m. GMT. For those who signed up for session two as well, it will start at 2 p.m. GMT. As each session is two hours long, feel free to grab a drink and snack to keep hydrated throughout the event. Also, be sure to stay until the end of the session for a chance to win a 10 pound Amazon e-voucher in today's lucky draw. To start off today's conference, I'd like to welcome Jia Chia Li president of the LSCSU Actuarial Society to give his opening remarks. Thank you, Stephanie. Dear distinguished speakers, students, lecturers, working professionals, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the Actuarial Conference 2020. Firstly, on behalf of the LSCSU Actuarial Society, I would like to thank our sponsor, Genry, as well as our partner, IFOA, for your support to this event and to the society. Next, I would like to thank three of our respectable speakers, Mr. Francis Chua, Mr. Francisco Sebastian, and Dr. Louis Pryor for taking some time out of your busy work schedule to speak at our conference. We really appreciate your presence and we are looking forward to hear your experiences and insights during your presentation later. Lastly, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today, no matter which university or even which country that you are from. So, the actual conference is the annual flagship event of the London School of Economics Students Union Actual Society. It has been held for the seventh year running and is currently the largest student-run actual conference in the UK. However, since our conference had to be held virtually this year, 
we opened our registrations to non-UK universities for the very first time in seven years. And to our amazement, we have received an overwhelming response with more than 400 undergraduate, postgraduate, and even graduated students registering for our conference from 50 universities around the world. As all of you know, the underlying theme for today is breaking the norm, bridging the gap. And in the first session, which is happening now, titled Actuaries as an Expanding Career, we aspire to introduce new emerging career opportunities in the actual field, aside from the traditional paths most actuaries pursue, for instance, in the insurance industry. And moving onwards, in the second session, Actuaries versus AI, which will take place at 2 p.m. GMT later, we aim to explore whether actuaries can coexist with AI in the near future and discuss the steps required to bridge the gap between traditional actuarial skills and the digital future. And with this great lineup of speakers, I strongly encourage everyone to participate fully in the conference and ask as many questions by dropping them in the chat box. Lastly, I hope that both sessions today will inspire all of you who are the actuaries of tomorrow. Without further ado, I would like to pass the floor back to Stephanie. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference today. Thank you, Chacha. Before we start, I would like to remind you that if you have any questions for the speaker, please leave them in the chat and will be addressed in the Q&A session. I would like to welcome today's first speaker, Mr. Francis Chua. Francis is the fund manager in LGIM's asset allocation team, responsible for a number of multi-asset funds. Francis carries out research on factor-based investing and fixed income strategies. Joining LGIM in October 2016, he was previously at Aviva, where he was responsible for the Aviva pension schemes, assisting in investment strategies and asset class research. Francis is a University of Warwick graduate, qualified actuary, and CFA charter holder. Please welcome Mr. Francis Chua. Thank you and a very good morning to uh, everyone. Well, good morning and good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, first and foremost, uh, obviously, I hope everyone's well and your families and close friends are safe at this difficult time. Uh, secondly, thank you to the uh, organizers for uh, having me to speak today. It's, uh, it's great to be able to speak. Um, and kind of thinking about how to best prepare for this presentation, I was reminded of uh, myself many years ago when I was kind of in a sim you know, similar situation. I was a young student trying to figure out what to do in my life, uh, trying to figure out you know, which career path to, to take. And I often found that these presentations, so you know, speakers uh, from the industry, really helpful. And I'm not obviously saying that because I'm here speaking to you today, uh, but I thought that actually you, know, you get a good uh, grounding on technical knowledge through university and your self-learning. Uh, but I found it personally anyway, very difficult to get a good idea of what was going on in industry. You know, what were the key trends? What were the key issues? What were the key questions that actuaries were trying to answer? And where were the opportunities for me as a young graduate uh, were going into the industry? So that's how I've kind of prepared the, uh, the presentation and try and give you as much of the information to give you, uh, uh, you know, a platform to uh, make a good decision for your future career or current career as it were. Uh, so to start, uh, next slide, please. Where do we start? So I thought I'll start by introducing my second favorite movie. Uh, why the second favorite movie? Well, to be honest, the first, my favorite movie of all time doesn't really fit in well with uh, this conference. Uh, so if one doesn't work, go on to the number two. And my second favorite movie is Back to the Future. Uh, which I'm sure many of you will have come across, either seeing it or heard of it. If you've not heard of it or seen it, uh, I highly recommend that you watch it. Uh, if you have seen and or watched it before, uh, I also highly recommend that you watch it again. Uh, but you also get some of the, uh, the uh, references that I will kind of put in in this presentation. Um, what's Back to the Future got to do with uh, actuaries? Uh, to be honest, not much. You know, I'm not here to surprise you and suddenly say, you know, the professor, or the doc uh, in, in the film is actually, uh, actually in disguise. And you know, he was using complex mathematical calculations to which he did obviously to, to design the time traveling machine. No, that's not that. The point here I was trying to get across is really um, to think about two things. If there's one thing, uh, if the main thing that you, if you can kind of take away from this presentation, hopefully is um, acknowledgement that actually the actual skill set is highly transferable. Uh, very much like the time traveling machine car, uh, it was you know fluid. It was traveling across different time periods, 
The skill set that you get as an actuary will allow you to traverse a time, industry, jobs, geography. Um, the opportunity is, is there for you to, to, to grasp. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the point here also is that, you know, being an actuary is not so much a destination, it's more of a journey. So kind of from my personal perspective, you know, I didn't just become actuary and then that was it. That was the end of my career progression. The opportunity, as I kind of said, is, is, is vast. So the skill set that you will get as, as, as it became as through becoming an actuary is, in my opinion, obviously, is um, highly uh, leverageable. Uh, and it will give you plenty of opportunities uh, to pursue different career paths. So that's kind of the, the introduction. So uh, I thought I'd start, I would kind of break the, the presentation down into the next three sections. So very quickly on who I am and my journey here. So I will touch on here the bits where I guess you can call it the norm and then the bits where uh, I was breaking the norm. Um, I started my, I guess, uh, actual uh, indulgence or got the seeds planted back in my uh, time at university. So I studied a course called Morse, uh, which uh, just stands for Mathematical Operation Research Statistics and Economics. Uh, one of the career paths that uh, graduates of Morse would uh, likely take is becoming an actuary. And back then, uh, this was uh, my second choice. Uh, yeah, there's a bit of a theme here. Uh, my first choice was actually to be an economist uh, but, you know, things didn't work out. Um, I didn't get a job as an economist. Um, I had a good internship with Mercer, uh, did well enough for them to offer me a job. So that's where I started my career, uh, within the actual industry, in the investment uh, part of the uh, actual industry. So Mercer is a, a large uh, investment consultant. Um, I kind of took the job uh, because, you know, one, it obviously gave me a job. And secondly, um, you know, with the idea that maybe further down the line, I could move into the, uh, the role of an, uh, an economist again. Uh, but obviously in 2007, 2008, the global financial crisis hit. Um, the number of jobs went from a very high level to a very low level. Um, so that kind of dream, uh, the window of opportunity uh, became smaller and smaller. Um, I was still able to move jobs. So I moved from Mercer to a company called Jardine Lloyd Thompson, uh, JLT in short, uh, which is actually now part of Mercer. Uh, in the same type of role, so investment consultancy, um, but here I was given the opportunity to move to a, a relatively smaller firm, get exposure to more senior individuals uh, in the investment profession. Um, and the, th the thing I'll kind of highlight here is that, you know, investment consultancy is uh, a known career path for investment uh, professionals in the actual space. And I think I will stress here that it's actually a really good training path for anyone who's young into the industry to really learn a lot about investing. The beauty of investment consultancy is you get to meet a variety of clients, you know, DB schemes, DC schemes, large schemes, small schemes, UK schemes, non-UK schemes, uh, and it really forces you to, to understand a, a, a kind of a breadth of, of uh, investment topics. Uh, it was during my time at JLT that I qualified as an actuary. I also got my CFA charter uh, holder at the time. A question I sometimes get asked is, you know, why do both? Isn't one enough? Uh, one, I have a habit of uh, knowledge gathering, so that's my personal uh, choice. And then secondly, from my perspective, I think the two are complementary. Uh, they're not in conflict of one another. Uh, uh, certainly the actual profession or the actual qualification gives you the depth of technical knowledge that you need in actual subjects. Uh, but to complement that, the CFA gives you the, the breadth. Uh, and in investment consulting, when you're kind of dealing with a wide variety of clients, you need both the, uh, the, the breadth and the, uh, the depth of investment knowledge, which is why I kind of did both. And I think personally, the only, uh, well, anyway, uh, from my view, that it has helped me um, as a person um, to, to kind of grow in, in the investment knowledge. The, the last thing I'd say about the, I guess, the traditional uh, route of investment consulting is that it also forces you to think about both the asset side of the equation and also the liability side of the equation. So think about, you know, how is the investment going? You know, how much return I'm getting? Is the level of risk that I'm running at the moment uh, enough, sufficient or too much? Uh, and then try to balance that against, you know, how much am I due to pay out in the, in the future for the people who are coming up to retirement and to balance the equation together. And that balancing of the equation is a very difficult thing to do. So it's a really good training uh, for a young professional uh, who is looking to move into the investment uh, world. 
to break that norm slightly, I guess, if you want to call it that way, uh, I moved to uh, Aviva working in the in-house uh, investment team, which uh, looked after the, the large pension schemes of, of Aviva. So we moved, I moved from uh, kind of a consultancy role into a, a client role. And here, you know, we started to move, uh, started to take on some of the investment making decisions ourselves. Uh, we had, I had more training on risk management, uh, derivative strategies. Uh, so further enhance uh, my technical knowledge uh, as it were. So that was kind of my past, my journey here. Uh, next slide, please. And this is, you know, me today, you know, a, a box of sweets and a pie chart uh, to simplistically uh, explain it. So I'm a multi-asset fund manager uh, at Legal General Investment Management or LGM in short. Uh, what do I do? I run a different, a number of different funds uh, with different risk profiles, different return profiles uh, for investors. Uh, and so here I've kind of rekindled my, my, uh, my love, if you want to call it with uh, economics, uh, because to be able to run a, a multi-asset fund, uh, you need to be able to have a good understanding um, of, you know, economics, uh, economic theory, obviously, the application of economic theory into asset prices, the application of asset prices into portfolio construction. Now, what are the skill sets uh, that my path as, you know, an investment consultant and an, as a qualified actually um, has brought me here today? Um, I, I'd say plenty. Um, if you were to take a job description of a fund manager and also an investment consultant, I don't think you'll be able to find many things that are, are kind of overlapped, uh, but the reality of it, I'm here to kind of share this with you to say that actually there's plenty more overlap than you might actually expect. One, uh, the technical knowledge that you gather as a training to become a qualified actuary is intense. Uh, so there is obviously the uh, emotional and discipline that you bring to your work uh, that is highly valued. Secondly, obviously the technical knowledge itself will put you on average, if not above average, to those individuals who are here. So, you know, uh, many of the fund managers at LGIM are, are not qualified actuaries, but they're technically very competent. But through the training of becoming an actuary, I am here or maybe slightly above average. Well, depends on who you speak to, obviously. Uh, and then thirdly, the, the knowledge of knowing uh, how pension schemes will invest is highly valuable. Why is it valuable? Because if you know how a certain group of investors will react to uh, guilt yields moving a certain percentage, to equity markets moving a certain percentage, then you as an investor can use that knowledge to better position yourself because you can anticipate what potential investors will do. So if guilt yields were to rise by say 1%, uh, I know that many DB schemes, uh, defined benefit, benefit pension schemes are still in deficit and they're looking to uh, lock in uh, yields at a favorable uh, choice. So I know that actually moving by 1% will invite more DB pension schemes to uh, buy guilt, for example. And so that kind of training that I've had for seven, eight years was not lost and actually is complementary to uh, my, my current role. Um, that's, that's kind of me today. Yes, thank you. The, the next stage. One of the things that I've often found useful in uh, people who could have kind of spoke to me in the past uh, from the industry is actually a forward-looking uh, trajectory because, you know, I'm joining the industry at that time, not to kind of replace them, but I have to recognize that in five to 10 years time, I need to be able to, to match where their growth uh, is. You know, there's no, I guess there's no point in, in me joining an industry and just trying to, to be who they were in, in the past. It's kind of positioning myself for the opportunities of the, the future. And then here I've kind of listed down where I think the opportunities for the future are for young kind of professionals moving into the actual uh, their space. Uh, the three key areas of, of actuaries, well, actually there are four, uh, apologize to anyone who's moving to healthcare, uh, but uh, <laughs> the three, three areas of uh, actual industry are pensions, in, in, uh, insurance and investments. Uh, so in pensions, you know, there's obviously a shift from defined benefit to defined contribution now to master trust. Uh, there's an ongoing question around, you know, are we saving enough? You know, future returns on assets are going to be low. So the emphasis on saving more is higher. Uh, are we saving enough? There are questions around demographics, you know, people are getting older. What does that mean for the pension pot that one has? Is that again enough? You know, does it last long enough for people in retirement? What, are, what about the retirement age? Uh, in insurance, you find the same things, you know, there's demographic issues. Uh, there's, I think, uh, analytics and AI at the, the, the forefront and very much incorporated into the way insurers uh, price stuff. 
Uh, and there's also a better engagement, I think, now with customers. So insurers are trying to move away from, you know, such a big distance between themselves and the underlying customer and to try and bridge that gap, which is a, is a huge opportunity uh, for growth. Uh, in investments, you know, there's obviously a move to, 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 to make things greener, so to be more sustainable, to be more responsible in nature. Um, if you are a large uh, wealth fund or pension scheme, you're thinking about whether I should be in illiquids or illiquids to try and capture a, a balanced uh, portfolio. Uh, and then the kind of the same thing, you know, AI is, is driving a lot of the decision making data gathering um, uh, analysis that we have in investments. Uh, in my last last uh, slide before I end is really to just leave you with some thoughts. Um, some of the young graduates who've joined uh, my team and the interns that I, I look after often ask me the question, Francis, do you think that it's worth me doing, you know, 15 exams to become an actuary? Um, you know, can I do something else? And my answer is always, you know, it really depends on what you want to pursue in life. I don't think that doing an, an actual qualification will detract you from your success. Uh, it is definitely a, a dedication to work, uh, but the benefits of it is, is far more than the effort that you kind of put in. It's an internationally recognized qualification and increasingly demanding, uh, sorry, an increasing demand from the international community. So, uh, you know, if you look at the statistics of where new members are, they are often not just in the UK, but uh, of course, across the world, and kind of the recognition of the skill set that actually bring to the table is growing. I would say uh, there's transferable skills between industries. Uh, you don't have to be just in a numbers-focused role. Um, you know, you can be uh, a bit more uh, sort of wide-ranging or different fields if you want. Um, and I think always, you know, as a core skill set for those who are who, who want to 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 uh, pursue a career in uh, in finance is that you have a good base in uh, analytical skills. Uh, and having that good base gives you, should give you the confidence to pursue any sort of role that you want in the, uh, the finance industry, trading, uh, risk management, asset management, investment banking, you know, the, the list is kind of endless. There we go, bang on time, 10.30. I'll leave it there and happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cha. I'm sure that the students will find this insights insightful. Now I will read out the questions that some students have written down for you. The first okay. one is from Keng Xian Pin. He is asking, did you pursue the finance and investment track of the IFOA or employers would prefer the CFA qualification in totality? So I pursued, to answer the first question, I pursued the finance and investment qualification, yes. Um, uh, because, you know, I was an investment consultant at that time, so uh, it was uh, complementary to my, my field of work. Uh, it would be very weird if I qualified uh, having done the insurance uh, qualification. Um, and what you will find that with the, the exams, I think the exams are changing now, but what I found with the exams uh, anyway is that it gives you a good uh, base across all industries. So I knew enough about pensions, I knew enough about insurance. But there's kind of that last leg where you really focus your attention to the uh, niche that you want to, to, to uh, excel in. And that was finance and investment uh, for me. Uh, the CFA question is a very topical question and has been a topical question for many, many years. Uh, if you look at some firms, you know, you will find that, you know, there are many CFA charter holders uh, in their kind of ranks. Um, uh, and, you know, in, it's easy to kind of make the conclusion that actually you don't need to be an actuary to be uh, an investment professional. You just need to do your CFA. I think the CFA is a good qualification. I've done it myself. And like I said, it gives you a breadth of, 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 of knowledge. Um, but if you were to challenge yourself, and I think if, you know, there's an opportunity to move into a different type of role, in particular, uh, in insurance, uh, I think the recognition for an actual qualification is, is definitely there for you. Okay, thank you. Now we will move on to the next question. The next question is from Kenneth. Kenneth is asking, what advice do you have for actuarial students who want to enter the investment industry after they graduate since they won't have experience with actuarial work? So I would say to Kenneth and anyone who's looking to do that is to, to invest time before you graduate uh, and to invest time before you graduate, i.e. spend time uh, doing an internship uh, in an investment firm or an actual firm to get that experience. 
more often than not, uh, employers are now looking beyond the, you know, yes, you've got good grades. A lot of people have good grades, but what else do you bring to the table? Um, you know, and that kind of what else do you bring to the table can take many shapes and forms. Some people that we've interviewed uh, that, that kind of try and address that by doing um, different things. So they either uh, learn about investing on their own. They either do a few of the exams on their own, uh, on, off their own. They um, obviously spend time as intern to, uh, to, to try and address that question. Um, so kind of the preparing for graduation actually starts a year or two years before graduation. Okay, thank you. Now we have another question from James. James is a third year BSc math student who's looking for a graduate actuarial job. If he doesn't get one, he wants to continue studying in higher education. So his question is, do you have any advice for people like James? And would you recommend an internship for those who can't find a job? Yes, definitely. So higher education is, is valued. So I've had a few friends, uh, qualified actors as well, who decided to do an MSc. Uh, and, you know, they've had successful careers. Uh, I've also got friends and myself included who took the internship path. I think both paths are, are possible. Um, and again, you want to be able to, to graduate with, you know, good degree uh, and good grades, and then plus there's something else to give you a competitive uh, advantage. So whether that competitive advantage is, you know, having a master's uh, in your kind of your CV or having spent a year, three months, you know, whatever the, the period is working with a, a firm and then, you know, bringing that to your future employer and say, I can help you uh, do this. The other point I would kind of raise here, and I didn't really touch on in my presentation, is a growing demand for uh, people who can do codes. And I think actuaries uh, are kind of people who can do codes very well and explain the codes uh, really well to the wider audience. And this is highly softer today. You know, we're moving into a world. We have moved into a world where data is is you know getting cheaper by the by the. Um, as time progresses, as data becomes cheaper, the usage of data increases. So we're moving to big data. And to be able to understand big data, there is a demand on computing power. So coders, uh, people who can you know, uh, write in different languages will be highly sought after. So that's another thing to think about uh, as well for those of you who are kind of planning for, for the future. Interesting. Um, so we have another question from Anda. Anda is asking, are there opportunities for insights and internships in the actuarial field? And do you recommend them for first year actuarial students to go into these internships? Uh, yes, we do. So um, yeah, uh, here at Elgin, we do uh, internships for, for, for uh, students. Um, typically those, not for, for your first year, uh, but you know, after your second year, kind of in your penultimate year and then moving on to your third year. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely opportunities uh, abound. Uh, I think, you know, this year has been uh, probably a bit more challenging. So I can't really speak for the rest of the industry. I don't know what the, the plans for hiring has been uh, across the industry. Maybe some firms continue to, to offer the opportunity. We do. Um, maybe some firms have decided to postpone the opportunity. So you really need to check, um, you know, whether that's still available. Okay, thank you. Um, Maureen and Kenneth are asking, when do you re recommend to start the CFA exams and should we take them during our time in university? So I, here's my personal trick. I think it's easiest to do it uh, when you're doing the actual exams. Why do I say this? Because uh, one, you're already in the study mode. So for me, having that kind of consistency and routine in studying really helped me in the, the, the CFA exams. And I, I did it in my later years in my actual exams. So I've done a lot of the, the, the initial exams where there's a bit of an overlap between our kind of the core initial core, they call it the core technical exams uh, and CFA level one. So CFA level one for me was, you know, kind of a given pass. Then the challenge was a bit more for CFA level two and then CFA level three was a, a bit more relevant to my day-to-day -day job. So that's my kind of trick. Uh, if you want to, you can do level one um, at the very start. And we've seen uh, some graduates uh, do that before they kind of join the industry, which shows, I guess, intent and dedication and interest into the investment industry. Um, yeah, that's, that, I don't think there's a fixed answer as to what's right or wrong. Um, thank you. I think we have uh, more time for more, more questions. 
So Fagisha is asking, would you advise on someone taking the actuarial exams while working, not necessarily in an actuarial role, or doing a master's in actuarial science that provides exemptions to speed up their path to qualification? Yes, so really good question. Um, and so kind of thinking about um, the friends that I kind of referred to earlier, um, I think this is something, there's a balancing act here. So uh, there's a trade-off, I believe, between uh, getting work experience and getting the exemptions very, very quickly. I don't think that getting all of the exemptions, so say, for example, if you've got you know, eight exemptions, nine exemptions, and you join the firm, uh, that doesn't necessarily automatically promote you to a very senior level because you don't have the, the work experience. So my personal view is that it is, is better for you to kind of gain the experience and the exams uh, alongside, but there's a balancing act because you are trading off more time uh, to try and study the exams uh, potentially longer. So if you obviously started with, you know, already nine under your belt, you know, the, the path to qualification is much quicker. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of a trade-off. Again, I don't think there's uh, a right answer or wrong answer. If you're looking for promotion, I don't think that will necessarily transpire. If you're looking for a shorter time to qualification, then yeah, that's probably one way to, uh, to do it. Okay. So, we have a question that asks about what study route do you suggest for a first year BSc student who wants to enter the investment field as an actuary? Do the actual, do the actual, <laughs> do the actual uh, undergraduate course or similar courses. Uh, you know, the actual qualification is very welcoming that you don't have to necessarily have to do an actual science at university. Um, you know, I did math, stats, operation research, economics. I'm someone who actually, you know, dreamt of becoming an economist. Uh, and, you know, they still welcome me with both arms. And, you know, in hindsight, it was probably the right thing to, uh, to do. So I don't think uh, there's a set. Obviously, if you do the actual uh, undergraduate, it gives you the, the, um, the same speaking language. If you're already doing the same kind of uh, things. Uh, but if you wanted to pursue just pure maths or stats or economics, uh, that's also possible. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tra. Um, we will have to end your, your Q&A session here, but don't worry for those whose questions are still left unanswered. We will raise these questions during the general Q&A session. Next, I would like to welcome Francisco Sebastian. Francisco's work mainly focuses on insurance and pension investment management for Wellington Management. On a daily basis, he constructs models on ex-ante returns and risks. In the past, he has also been in the European Commission's Financial Crisis Task Force, so facing the strangest uncertainties is quite straightforward for him. Francisco will be giving us an insight into what the banking industry has to offer and how actuarial students are best equipped to enter this field. Over to you, Mr. Francisco. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening. Um, I'm glad that I'm uh, speaking after Francis because uh, a lot of what he said is something that I will definitely confirm. I 100% I agree with, uh, I would say, everything he said. So very, very wise words from Francis. Thank you. Um, I, I, my, my career is slightly different from his. Um, still exciting, I hope. And uh, what I can tell is that my PowerPoint skills are definitely be below his. That, that, that's for sure, as you will see very soon. Um, I'm going to walk you through it, but first I will start by introducing myself. Maybe if we can turn to the next page, please. Um, yeah, can we switch pages, please? Can we move on to the next page? All right, well, uh, it looks like we're having some technical problems there. Um, in, ah, there we go. <laughs> There you can you can see three boxes basically where I'm explaining my education, my uh, skills, and uh, areas of professional knowledge. The reason why I'm showing you this is because if you look at the CV of someone who has some experience in the financial industry, banking, investments, insurance, probably you will see a lot of items that are there already. One of them, uh, Francis has explained, is the FIA. But you know there are others like the MBA. It's another interesting venue for qualification. There is also languages. There were some questions about 
programming languages, I feel that's a very important skill to have in one's CV as well, technology in general, as well as uh, broader areas of professional knowledge. Some of them can be gained through the CFA or other technical qualifications. In other cases, it's more a matter of professional experience and self-study. In my case, I found over, my, over the years in my career, experience in accounting, in financial regulation, especially solvency too in my case, and in uh, securities valuation or securities pricing, very, very, very useful. I think economics, having an uh, overlay of economic knowledge is also very important as well as financial market savviness. Lately, ESG, environmental, social and governance, uh, Characteristics are also important, uh, important and is an area that seems to be uh, relevant for the future. Now, uh, how have I got all of these items in my toolkit over the years? In the next page, uh, you can see, um, if we can turn on, please, um, you can see a chart of what I've done in my professional journey. So I started, as most of you or all of you, with some undergraduate education. In, in business administration and then in actuarial science. Then I moved on briefly into investment banking. Then uh, after that brief stint, I moved on to the government. There I was uh, lucky enough to first of all, work on um, the, uh, the development of the uh, Solvency II directive before it was uh, approved. And then later during the great financial crisis, I was part of the um, Financial Crisis Task Force, which dealt with all the recaps and the bailouts of the different financial uh, services companies that were well, that received uh, some form of financial bailout with the European Commission. So that was very exciting work, always front page of the Financial Times and other newspapers. After that, I took an MBA and uh, went to New York to learn more about how things were done in the US. And that was a good way of doing it. I went to Columbia Business School where I you know, le learned a lot of things and also developed a very useful network. And from there, back to work, uh, joining uh, PIMCO, a, a very large investment management firm, first in California in the headquarters and then moving back to London. And from there, a couple of years ago, I moved back to I moved to Wellington Management, another large investment management firm where I, where I work. In, 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 in my day to day is I'm a quantitative analyst. As part, despite the length of my title, basically what I do is quantitative analysis. I'm very much focused in the field of insurance and pensions. Although in the past, I've also been involved extensively with banks as well. Now, um, what is probably more interesting is what I've I would say, at least to me, is what I've learned uh, over the years. So if we can turn um, to the next page here. You know, I would say this is what I took away in a, in a nutshell. Um, as an undergrad, I learned that science is fun. And if, if someone doesn't find it fun, probably they should be rethinking about what they want to do in life because uh, it's going to be surrounding you for many, many years as an actuary. Um, then in investment banking, uh, what I learned is that, you know, going to university and having all that science in your brain gives you the foundations, which is really good, but is not enough. Uh, the world changes very quickly and the financial industry especially changes very quickly and you gotta keep, you have to keep up with it. So you always have to keep teaching yourself things either through getting professional qualifications, the CFA, the FIA, lots of acronyms, or simply by getting a book and studying it and practicing and, and reading. Um, another very good way of learning is talking to people, uh, you know, networking, being part of work groups. That's incredibly helpful as well. Then uh, moving on to the government, uh, the government is, is a bit of, a, of, a, of an unusual beast because um, a lot of people find it very opaque. A lot of people don't understand regulation and they are thinking, well, you know, it's a lot of words, a lot of law that I hardly understand. I am comfortable with formulas. I'm comfortable with algebra, but I'm not comfortable with all these words. How do I deal with it? Well, that's obviously a barrier that has to be broken. Uh, but once it is broken, I would say, uh, first of all, uh, you, you can find out that regulation is a huge innovator. And especially in the financial industry, I mean, solvency too is definitely an example of that. But 
um, Basel, uh, the Basel regulations are, are definitely another great example of it. And you're seeing it across Asia with uh, new risk based frameworks, um, how those are changing the landscape very quickly. The other imp important aspect of regulation that I learned from the government is that um, real life is different from the models. So the economics of things, the logic, the science of things is, is very valid, uh, but real life is very often affected by regulation and regulation changes the dynamics of that, uh, of that logical thinking that science provides. So it's important to understand real life to know that regulation because the behavior of market participants is not always going to be rational, but it's, well, it's always rational, just affected by regulation. Um, and then um, I, I, as a postgraduate student, as an MBA student, I learned that networking is absolutely critical. Uh, so the best knowledge often comes from the network. Basically, you don't need to know everything as long as you know someone who can help you understand when you have a problem. So knowing that person is critical and that usually comes from the, from the network. And second, um, the best jobs, the best job opportunities usually come from the network as well. And then finally, in investment management, I would say biggest takeaway is that what you say does matter, but how you say it is even more important. The investment management uh, industry is incredibly competitive. There are plenty of very talented people working in it, and a lot of them have very valid and important things to say. Now, not everyone becomes successful at it because not everyone can phrase it in a way that makes sense to others, but, but it is, cut, is as catchy. So we are, a lot of us are saying the same things just in different ways. So how you say things does, in, does matter a lot. Now, um, bringing this back to you, to what could be more relevant to you, I wanted to show you on the next page how what you should expect in your careers if you're starting or at the very beginning of those how this will change over time. So one important thing to think about is how things will change over time. At the very beginning of your career, either as an undergrad student or recent graduate, or even a postgraduate student in the first three, five years of your career, technical knowledge is the main building block. It's a lot of formulas. It's a lot of uh, book knowledge that you need to uh, that you need to get and that is basically what most people are going to be evaluating you on so do you know your math or not do you know your technicals or not do you pay attention to detail or not professional knowledge is nice to have is not expected yet as you a lot of you probably haven't had the, uh, the experience and you haven't got the chance to become uh, professionally knowledgeable but there is also all these professional qualifications. I would say the FIA is definitely one of those, but also the CFA and, and, and other comparable ones that will give you a little bit of professional knowledge. But a lot of that is um, collected through experience. So it's spending time at the office, basically, and doing work is how you gain professional knowledge. Typically, you tend to focus on one area and over time, you develop it gradually until you move on to other areas of professional knowledge. In my case, for example, I've mentioned accounting is an area of professional knowledge, also technical to an extent, securities pricing, securities valuation, not just knowing the math behind it, but also knowing how to do it in practice and what works and what doesn't. I think that for me, it was very, very important and useful. And then finally, the soft skills. At the very beginning of your career, I mean, soft skills are always important, but they are probably less important. I don't think anyone will be expecting that you are able to address a 300 people audience in a very engaging manner, probably because you will not get the chance to do it. But over time, it's something that is, becomes much, much more relevant in your career. So you can see on the right hand side of the slide how over time, you know, 15, 20 years down the road, soft skills will become a huge building block in your career. Professional knowledge, incredibly important, whereas technical becomes a little bit less important. By the way, it's not that the volume of that technical knowledge box has decreased. I mean, it does decrease a little bit because we end up forgetting things if we don't use them, but it's because the soft skills and the professional knowledge skills have grown so much that have outsized 
technical knowledge. So probably uh, most people who are a little bit further advanced in their careers, like, like me, probably will agree with, with this chart that uh, you know, technical knowledge is very important at the beginning, it's critical, but over time it becomes a little bit less important and soft skills and professional knowledge become much more relevant. Now, um, we can also move on to the, uh, to the next page just to uh, um, start concluding here. Um, but how, as an actuary, you know, how do I do all these things? Uh, I, I agree with Francis, a lot of the skills and the knowledge that you have are very, very transferable. Uh, in particular, I found algebra, calculus, financial mathematics, statistics, and actuarial mathematics incredibly useful to develop a career outside of the traditional actuarial field. In, in my day-to-day, -day, I use financial risk models, credit, interest rates, equities, you name it. Those models some of them are more complex than others, but what they all have in common is a lot of calculus and algebra underlying. So if you are able to understand algebra and calculus, and usually as a qualified actually you tend to do, um, you know, learning those financial risk models, it's a lot simpler. Um, portfolio optimization is the same. It's, it's a lot of linear programming. It's something that uh, a graduate in mathematics or physics has, has done to an extent, but any actuary has studied as well. Securities pricing relates a lot to financial risk models. Um, again, it's a lot of uh, actuary or well, financial mathematics, algebra and calculus. Simulation and prediction involves a lot of stochastic calculus, which is uh, basically statistics. Um, then financial markets and economics is slightly different, but a lot of the financial market science and the economic science under, underlying models are all uh, mathematical models at the end of the day. So therefore, having those very strong foundations that you get as an actuary is very, very useful to learn new things. So just, I'll take a little step back here. I said, it is important to always keep learning. So you know a lot of things already when you graduated from university, but you don't know everything, you know useful things, you need to move on to the next stage. And building on those foundations will be incredibly useful. So leverage on what you have to keep building. Then finally, moving on to the, uh, to the final slide, I also wanted to give you a bit of three takeaways that, uh, that hopefully uh, will be useful over the time. First of all, is that uh, you need knowledge. You need knowledge at the beginning of your career to be able to move to the next steps. And that knowledge is absolutely everywhere. And a lot of the time is free as well. So use it, use it in many different ways. A lot of the knowledge comes from professional networks. So just join and participate in those professional networks. I think the, the Institute and Faculty of Factories is a great network. It provides a lot of uh, knowledge and a lot of gets you in touch with a lot of people who are very knowledgeable about what you do and have a lot of experience. It's a great way of learning about different things. And then uh, finally, use what you have already, use what you know already as an actuary to build onto the, uh, the next level and move on to the next level in your careers. Hopefully, um, you know, you, you, you will be very successful. I, I think if you apply these, these rules, it's a matter of always keeping up to speed with how the market is changing, with how things uh, develop over time and staying in touch with people, being always uh, capable of learning new things is, is definitely the most important thing. So I think I've uh, taken my 15 minutes. So um, I'll move on to the Q&A section. Thank you, Francisco. I'll now read out some questions that the students have for you. This is uh, a lot of them are related to programming. So I'll just read some that's from Kung Xian Pin and Aisha. They were asking about the main programming software used in financial modeling in the industry currently, and how do we get good command on it if we do it by self-study? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not a programmer myself. I'm just someone who uses uh, programming languages for his own benefit. In particular, I use two different things. I use uh, VBA because it's the one that works really well with Excel as well and also it's very graphical and I use Python as well. I've taught myself both of them and taken pretty much 
watch videos online on YouTube. Whenever I have uh, you know, something that doesn't work, I just look it up. The internet is full of resources. As I said, there's plenty of knowledge for free out there. Um, in terms of languages, I would say probably those two are incredibly relevant. Lately, probably because of the volume of data, um, using Python is particularly relevant. Um, also, if someone knows R, I think R is another useful language. I think it's less frequently used than Python these days, but R is also a very, uh, a very valuable language. One, one useful thing about programming languages is that once you know one of them, learning the next one is a lot easier because the logic tends to be very, very similar and sometimes even the syntax. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a field that um, if you haven't got the chance to learn at, at university, probably it is worth spending a little bit of time on uh, because it will pay off in your career, especially uh, when you're trying to model things, when you're trying to develop things, and it can give you an edge over other people who uh, might have a very deep knowledge as well, but don't have that practical uh, expertise. Okay, now we have a question from Kenneth. Kenneth is asking, what made you realize that you wanted a role in investment banking rather than the traditional act in actuarial insurance path? Um, well, I had always been um, involved with the financial markets. Even as a student, I liked buying stocks and losing money most of the time, actually. <laughs> but um, I, I always liked that. And uh, back, in, back in the time we're talking about 2001, uh, investment banking was um, an incredibly hot uh, career path. It was financially very rewarding and it was also very exciting. It attracted a lot of incredibly intelligent people. Um, so it was, it was, for me, it was kind of a, um, a, a you know, whatever, a lot of my, my friends from university were doing as well. So I was very naturally attracted to it. Um, I, I, Obviously, I, I'm not, I, I didn't continue in that path because I found that there were other things that I was more interested in. But, um, but it's not, it's not uh, you know, I, I think it's still, even today, it's still a very good career path, especially for a, for a graduate or recent graduate student because, um, because investment banks uh, have very good training programs and uh, they hire incredibly intelligent and uh, talented people. Uh, so they put you in touch with, other colleagues that will be very um, competitive, that will be, you know, uh, very knowledgeable, and you can always learn from them. So uh, I would say, um, you know, first of all, you have to like financial markets. If you don't, probably don't go to an investment bank. Uh, but even if, uh, you know, once you do, um, you, you get the reward of being in touch with, uh, with uh, very knowledgeable and, um, and very uh, well-rounded people. Thank you. Um, now we have a question from Desmond. Desmond is asking, can you give a recommendation of books to read for actuarial students that plan to work in the investment industry? Yes, um, there, are, there are a few of them. Obviously, uh, books, books to read, there are, there are so many of them. Um, I think there are uh, some basics, depending on what you want to do, but probably I would try to get a book on corporate valuation, so company valuation, if you're interested in working more on the corporate side. Whereas if you're uh, interested more in the, on the financial market side, uh, the, there are plenty of good books out there on fixed income, uh, on uh, derivatives valuation, um, rather than giving you a list here that probably is my own personal choice. Maybe if you want to reach out to me directly on LinkedIn, for example, I can give you a, a list of, of items that could be relevant and I'm happy to share them with others as well. Um, okay, so we have more questions and a lot of it is interested in professional networking. So they are asking what methods would you suggest to expand our professional network while pursuing our studies? And um, how, does, how do we as a student become active in the professional network? Um, well, it's it, as as uh, you you're you're doing it to an extent right now, right? You're you're networking with different people by listening to what they have to say um, and 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 asking questions. So this is networking. But I would say, uh, while I was at university, my most powerful network was at university. Was my friends from university? Was my professors? Was all these people that I was interacting with? 
And by the way, over the years, I've kept in touch with a lot of them. And, um, you know, there, there is a, a person in my network who's also a good friend of mine. Uh, he's he's uh, the biggest expert in banking I know. Whenever I have a question about some very technical aspect, I just reach out to him. We've stayed friends for 20 years, and it's someone that I met at university. So expect your uh, you know fellow students to be people that, not all of them, but a lot of them that you will stay in touch with and that hopefully you can reach out to when you have a question. Um, it's, it's good to support each other, it's good to help each other. And it's, uh, it's uh, although we are always a little bit competitive, you know, helping each other is definitely something that pays off um, uh, over the years. Now, uh, in terms of professional networks, there are plenty of conferences that will take a you as a student for free and will give you the chance to ask questions to go there. So that's a very good network. Whenever there is a careers event at university, go and ask questions, ask informed questions and have a little brief um, elevator pitch to show what you can do. So th those are, I think, examples of networking, but I, I would say first and foremost, use your current network, which is your, uh, the other students at your university and your professors. That's probably the best place for you to start with. Okay, now we have a question from Brian. Brian is asking what skills are required in order to stay competitive in investment banking? Sorry, the, the skills in investment banking, is that the question? Yeah, how to stay competitive in investment banking. <laughs> um, well, it's a, I, I would say what I did is basically a lot of reading. I read absolutely everything that I could get in my hands. Um, normally, it's, it's not very structured, or at least I didn't do it in a very structured manner as you know, when you're studying. It, it's more like papers here and there, articles, uh, reports. Um, but over time, you know, uh, even if it if it uh, seem, if it seems to be a little bit scattered in practice, what you're doing is building a network of knowledge and connecting the dots over time. Um, once once you're in the financial industry, uh, you're going to be surrounded by articles by people giving opinions. I just try to read absolutely everything. And whenever you get the chance to speak with someone who is an expert in a subject matter do not hesitate to ask questions. Ask informed questions, but please do ask questions because do you, uh, you get access to all these very knowledgeable people for free when you're working in the financial industry. And it's, it's a privilege that definitely should be used very intelligently. Thank you, Francisco. Unfortunately, the time for the Q&A session has ended. But for those of you who have uh, whose questions are left unanswered, don't worry, because we will address them in the general Q&A session. OK, up next, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Louise Pryor, president-elect of the IFOA. Dr. Pryor has truly employed her actuarial skills across a number of careers. She has been an actuarial consultant, computer scientist, software, software risk consultant, and climate risk specialist. Most recently, she has led the development of the technical actuarial standards at the FRC. She is an IFOA council member and recently chaired the IFOA resource and environmental board. She is the current chair of the London Climate Change Committee and non-executive director of the Building Society. We're also incredibly fortunate to hear from Dr. Pryor today because it was announced in March that Dr. Louis Pryor has been named the president-elect of the IFOA and will serve as president from June 2021. Over to you, Dr. Pryor. Thank you, Stephanie, and hello, everybody, and welcome. I have not had a traditional actuarial career, and I'm not working in traditional actuarial roles now. If we can move to the next slide, please. So what I do now is I'm president-elect of the IFOA, and that is a role for which I do actually need to be an actuary. You may be surprised to hear, but yes. I am chair of something called the London Climate Change Partnership, which is a voluntary role. And it's a, the London Climate Change Partnership is a partnership of organizations who are trying to help London adapt to climate change. I do not need to be an actuary to be that, um, to hold that role. 
I'm a non-executive director of the Ecology Building Society, which is a building society um, with a very um, with an environmental mission. We lend money to help people um, make their houses more energy efficient and more environmentally friendly. And we also do a lot of lending to um, community housing, co-housing schemes, that sort of thing. I do not need to be an actuary to hold that role. I'm also a director of Calend Consulting, which does actuarial consulting in um, uh, emerging economies on pensions and social security reform. I don't actually need to be an actuary to do that role either, because we have a couple of directors who aren't actuaries, who are um, economists and other things. However, for that one, um, I'm, I'm there because I am an actuary, I think. So you can see that a lot of what I'm doing now doesn't actually require me to be an actuary. So how have I got here? Next slide, please. I started off in a in a very traditional way. I'd read maths at university. I went into actuarial consulting. This was back in the early 1980s when there were a lot more, a lot of um, smaller firms around. I worked, in fact, for a, a consultancy called um, Taz, Perrin, Foster and Crosby, which is the one of the precursors of, of, of Willis Towers Watson, and I did pensions. I decided I was not particularly interested in pensions, didn't like the work. So I then moved to a firm called Tillinghast, which is now also part of the whole Willis Towers Watson enterprise. And I moved there to do consulting in life insurance. This was when unit linked life was really taken off. There was um, a lot of interesting work, but in the end, actually, I wasn't that interested in that. And I decided I want to get into general insurance. Um, and Tillinghast was at that time one of the few consultancies operating in general insurance in, in, in the UK, the actuarial consultancies. General insurance was a very new field for actuaries at that time. And that was interesting and I qualified as a fellow and all that, um, but then I decided that actually I didn't want to do this, I wanted to do something else. I wanted to really get into a topic and do a PhD and I was absolutely fascinated by artificial intelligence. So I went off to the States, I went to Northwestern University just outside Chicago and did a PhD in artificial intelligence. And I'll be talking a bit more about that in session two this afternoon. And one of the things is that if you're in a job, you're surrounded by, or in a career path, you're surrounded by people doing that career path and it's quite difficult to break out of it. So it's actually quite difficult to make the decision to go off and do a PhD in a totally unconnected field. But then once I did the PhD, what you do in the sort of PhD career path is what a lot of people do is they go on to um, become university lecturers. So I did that at Birmingham and Edinburgh universities um, in AI, which tends to be in computer science departments. But then I decided that actually the life of an academic wasn't for me for various reasons. I in, enjoyed um, addressing real problems rather than sort of problems I'd dreamt up to, um, to, to, to intrigue a potential funder. So I went into commercial software development, working for a smallish startup country, uh, company. Um, and then that one went bust. So I joined another smallish an even much smaller startup company, and then that went bust. That's what happens in the startup world. Very few of them actually make it through. So I got fed up of being out of work because people couldn't get their act together on managing companies. So I sort of sat down and thought a bit about what do I know? I know about software development, but I also know about being an actuary. And actuaries, um, we've at this stage where around um, 20 years ago, so the early years of this century, actuaries use software a lot. A um, lot of spreadsheets, for example, 
But what was happening in those days was people weren't really taking the software development side of their jobs very seriously. So I thought, well, look, let's let's get actuaries to think about software development, to think about all these spreadsheets they're writing and connecting together in, in goodness knows how um, as a risk problem. Um, thinking about how you can apply some software engineering techniques to making your spreadsheets less risk prone. So I did that for some years um, as a freelance. It was kind of interesting. I also did some software development along the way. I was working for um, a, um, a, a consulting firm and I was writing um, asset liability models, that sort of thing. Um, and then for various personal reasons, um, I decided that I actually wanted to get a proper job again. It was by that stage, it wasn't actually clear to me what sort of proper job I could get. I knew that I actually wanted to be moved back sort of pro probably more connected to the actuarial world. Um, but I, I just didn't, I couldn't do, I couldn't be a, a sort of straightforward GI or life actuary any longer because I just simply wasn't up to speed on, on the techniques and everything. But then this job came up at the Financial Reporting Council, um, which had just generally um, sort of started doing actuarial stuff. This was just after the Morris Review that, that took all the standards and the oversight to the Financial Reporting Council. And they needed someone who knew a bit about general insurance um, and could basically work with general insurance actuaries on, on the new standards. So I did that and then the director of actuarial standards left and I got that job. So I ended up leading the development of the technical actuarial standards and I really enjoyed that job. It's got a lot um, in common with computer programming, which I've always enjoyed. So I can talk about that a bit later if you're interested. But then we finished developing the standards and they sort of moved on to maintenance and enhancements and so on. And it turns out that I'm not a maintenance kind of person. I'm a building new things kind of person. So I left that and went back to freelancing. Um, I also decided at that stage that climate change was the most important problem facing our world. And I wanted to do something about that. So I said, I'm going to try and pivot this time into sustainability. And I did that um, mainly by just telling people that that was what I knew about and worked in. Um, how did I know about it? Through the, a lot of the volunteering I did through the IFOA, I got involved in the then Resource and Environment Board, now the Sustainability Board. I did working parties and I just really, really focused on that area. Um, but also at that time, I got connected with Calland doing pensions and social security reform in developing countries. And that fitted in to a certain extent with my um, decision, not, not sort of the environmental side, but to do work that matters, that to do work that makes the world better. So here I am um, nearly 40 years after I started work um, and what do I see in, the, in, in that pattern? I see there are some themes there. I've always looked at risk and uncertainty. Software and model building has always been a really big part of my work. My PhD in artificial intelligence, for example, was about how um, robots, if you like, can, can cope with uncertainty in their world they don't know exactly what's going to happen how can they they plan to achieve their goals under uncertainty um, part of that work was about thinking about how ais who are who have goals to achieve can take recognize and take part of opportunity take advantage of opportunities but what i've done throughout my life is taken advantage of opportunities i've never had a plan i've never known what i wanted to do and i always enjoy doing new things which is why i've moved around so much and done so different so many different things and haven't stayed in the same industry and you know i've moved from industry to industry i've moved from um, consulting to academia doing all sorts of different things but if something's come up, 
um, like the FRC job. It wasn't what I was planning to do, but I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, I'll give it a go. So I gave it a go. And the point is that my actuarial skills and background haven't limited me. I haven't said, oh, I can't do that because that's not what actuaries do. I've said, gosh, my skills could be really helpful there because it's a different way of, of applying them. So I think that's really important to think of your actuarial skills as enablers rather than as limiters. Next slide, please. So how, how have I changed careers or how do you get into any career? You, th you think about what can you do or what do you know about, what you're interested in and what matters to you. And if you want to move into a particular area, learn about that area, learn about new things. Nowadays with the internet, which of course didn't exist when I started work, you can, there's fantastic opportunities. There's a lot of MOOCs out there that you can do either for free or very cheaply to pick up new skills. You can get involved, participate, take part in voluntary activities, take part in um, things that are nothing to do with actuaries. If you're interested in, in climate change, why not get involved with a local environmental group around near you or whatever? In your, if you're interested in, in social impact questions, why not get involved with a voluntary organisation sort of helping other people learn about things from the ground up? So keep learning and this is something that um, both um, Francesco and Francis have said and it's really really important keep learning and that's what one of the things that matters to, to me is doing new things and learning about new things right next slide please so some ideas of what actuaries can do obviously anything to do with risk management all sorts of exciting things that the foundation of being an actuary is really thinking about long term financial risk. So all sorts of areas in there. But why stick to insurance and pensions? Other organisations need to think about these things, modelling the future profitability of a line of business, which is what um, we do in insurance all the time. Why you know, do that in another area? Data analytics is something we're really keen on. We seem to have lost the slides, but never mind. Um, data analytics is, is a skill that actuaries um, have that we're building into the exams more, that we've got a credential in data analytics. Go for it. Think about where you can, where you can use it. Um, Scenario analysis, something that we do a lot of in the insurance world, thinking about um, risk management and capital requirements. Um, increasingly, other organisations are doing that. So moving on to a slide which is about where can you do it? Where can you do use these types of skills? Obviously, insurance and pensions. Obviously, banking. Banking is a huge expansion area for actuaries and think about what you can do there. Lots of opportunities, I believe, in climate change and resource management, energy modelling, thinking about ag agricultural adaptation, scenario analysis and risk reporting, as I've said, the whole um, TCFD initiative about reporting on climate risk, which applies to pretty much everybody. Get in there. It's not the actuarial certificates that will get you jobs. It's your interests, abilities and skills. Any organisation with customers or members is thinking about how it can retain those customers and members. And that's a lot of what um, life insurers do when they think about um, pricing, customer management and everything. Any organisation that's interested in learning from its data really the sky is your limit. The world is your oyster. Go out there and do things that matter to you and that you find interesting. So my 15 minutes is up. I'm afraid I've gone one minute over. Very, very happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Pryor. Now I will read out the questions that the students have to for you. Thank you. So Bob is asking how transferable are actuarial skills to the field of computer science and vice versa? That's really interesting. Um, having worked in both, I think um, 
a lot of the same types of people tend to do both. It's the attention to detail, the logical thought, the mathematical ability. I've always been, I mean, I, I, I still do computer programming for fun. Okay, I'm weird, but hey, you know, we've all got some weirdness about us. Um, so I would say very much, one of the things that's important is computer pro programmers have to have an eye for detail because you have to get the details right but it's also very important to have a top-down view to think what's the overall aim of the system you're building and i think the same is very much in actuarial work that you're doing calculations about um you know about um, capital requirements and so on and what's the overall aim you have to put that in in the context of the insurance company or the pension fund or whatever so this 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 i think is a skill that transfers very well from actuarial work into computer coding um, and i think probably certainly in my experience most actuaries are better at doing that than most computer programmers. Computer pro programmers aren't trained so much to think the top-down bit is important, but it actually really is. Whereas it's something that's, that, that is, is very much second, or I hope it is, should be second nature to actuaries. Okay, thank you. We, have, we now have a question from Irina. Irina knows she wants to be an actuary, but doesn't really know which one. Is it difficult for someone to change from, let's say, insurance to investment if um, someone doesn't like what they do? I think it varies. It, it, you know, if you're working in an employer that does all these different things, you might well be able to do it. Um, my, if I have any regrets about my career, it is that in some cases I haven't moved on quickly enough. I've stuck at doing something that I'm not really enjoying and I didn't make the effort to change. If you do want to change areas, you, you have to make a deliberate choice. So it doesn't happen automatically, just because just you want to change, it's not going to happen. You have to find out about the areas, the possible areas you want to move into. You have to think about what appeals to you. You have to sit down and think about how your skills, your experience could be useful. Maybe do some um, independent studying to, so that you, you know, you're not going in not knowing anything. So it's certainly always possible. I mean, I did a major career change um, when I was over 50. You know, you can do it, but you, you, you have to think about it and take it seriously. Okay, thank you. We now move on to the next question. The next question is from Samuel. Samuel is asking, is there a high market demand for freelance actuaries or do most companies prefer to hire actuaries on a permanent basis? Um, it varies a lot. Um, it tends to go in cycles. Um, I was doing very freelancing in that I essentially was doing sort of small consulting jobs, but there are a lot of actuaries who do contracting, which means that they take on short term sort of full time employment contracts um, with employers. And that can be a fantastic way. Once you've got some experience, it can be a fantastic way to broaden your outlook. Um, and get different experience. So I, I can't say what it's going to be like in even two or three years time because the, 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 you know, the economic cycles, employment uh, scene changes so rapidly. Okay, now we have a question from Max. Max is saying, would you say that there are many graduate positions for people who would like to become actuaries to work in modeling and assessing the risk of climate change? No, probably not. To be honest, um, you probably need to get a job in a reasonably mainstream actuarial employer, though there are others that you may be able to persuade to take you on, it's going to be harder. But within mainstream actuarial employers, there's an increasing focus on environmental issues. The insurers are doing a lot of work on it um, to, in order to do their TCFD reporting and risk management. 
Um, increasingly, the pensions consultancies have big, um, or growing anyway, ESG teams, environmental, social and governance teams on the investment consulting side, and are having to think about climate risk on the mainstream pension side too. So if you go to a mainstream em employer, um, you should be able to work your way around to specialising in, in that area as well. Okay, now we have a question from Fagisha. Fagisha is asking that, looking that you've worked in various field, fields of um, over the years, how welcoming is the professional world for people who do not have a linear career path and want to try different things? Oh, that varies so much, you know. It, 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 um, it, it varies by the, the company, you know, different companies take different attitudes to that. Um, you know, I, when I've been hiring, when I was a software manager, I was hiring software teams and everything. I've always, I think, naturally tried to hire people with varied backgrounds because personally, I think that people with varied backgrounds um, bring a lot to the table because they, they, you know, they think in different ways and everything. On the other hand, that's possibly because that, that's me. So I've fallen into the old trap of, of hiring people like me. Um, what you need to do is you you never get a job because you're holding a certificate okay your actuarial certificate isn't a ticket to a job what it is is it's proof that you've got some skills and techniques but people are going to hire you because they think those skills and techniques are useful and increasingly as you move on because you've got other things as well that you're, you know, you've got other expertise that isn't represented just by your certificate. So what you need to do, I mean, I know people go on and on and on about transferable skills, but that's absolutely it. To get any job, you have to convince the employer that you've got the skills and expertise and attitude and ability to learn new things that that job requires. Okay, thank you. We have um, time for one more question. This question is from Jatin. Jatin is asking how big of an impediment for the computer science bachelors will be while trying to get them hired for your first job as an actuarial analyst? Probably not. Um, I, again, it's going to depend on, on employers. But I mean, I know people that have, have come in as actuarial analysts from all sorts of different backgrounds, dis different degrees they've done. Um, you have to, I mean, people come in with um, PhDs in maths, in chemistry, in physics. They come in with undergraduate degrees. I know one woman who converted from being a vet. She was a qualified vet treating animals and moved into being an actuary. You have to you know, you can do it. You just have to prove that you're um, numerate enough to do the exams. Um, and you have to accept that you have to go back to the beginning. So if you've got huge skills elsewhere, they may not be particularly valued in the initial step, but they will absolutely come to, 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 to be relevant as you move on. You know, by the time you're some years into your career, it's the sum total of your experience that makes you what you are and enables you to, to do things. It's it, not just the last two years or certainly not just the certificates you hold. Thank you, Dr. Pryor, for sharing your insights. We will now proceed with our general Q&A session. If you have any questions for any of the speakers, feel free to leave them in the chat and we will ask the speakers for you. So previously we have some unanswered questions and I will start reading them out. Um, this is for any speakers who, would, who are willing to answer them. Um, okay, this one is about um, environment and climate issues. Um, Matthew is asking, how can an actuary contribute to solve environmental problems? I don't know in detail, but we think about risk. Um, climate risk is a big risk. Environmental risk in general is a big risk. So there's lots of areas that we can use our skills. 
um, I'd say get involved, um, volunteer. The um, IFOA is running a pool system for sustainability volunteers at the moment. You sign up and you say, I want to volunteer. Um, I'm not for a specific working group or anything, but put me in your pool and I'm interested in opportunities that come up. Get involved in local environmental groups. There are always groups um, in every city and often every neighborhood thinking about how you can green your neighborhood, um, you know, local action plans, all that sort of thing. Just get involved. Okay. Um, I would. I would add to that, um, I, I agree with, uh, with Louis, I do not know the answer, but I can uh, maybe talk about my experience and what we are, like I think the financial industry or the investments industry is doing. We think about this uh, in a way that is basically, we try to understand what are the risks that are out there from an environmental standpoint and how do they impact investment portfolios. From there, we try to measure it. And indirectly, one could argue what gets measured gets managed. I think it's uh, Kotler who said that, uh, you know, indirectly, once we understand how much risk there is and what are the potential implications, and I'm not talking about a five minute bulleted talk, I'm talking about knowing the very details of it, that's when we can start managing it. But first, it's a matter of measuring and understanding. And I myself, I don't feel I'm at a stage of making any investment or any other kind of decisions based on what we have. I'm still at the stage of measuring and understanding. But hopefully very soon, I would say in the next couple of years, we will move on to the let's make decisions based on that information type of uh, stage. And that's where I think uh, actors can help basically first measuring and once that measurement has been done, helping make the decisions. Okay, so next question, we have a question from Doreen. Doreen is asking, how can actuaries branch into investing or do something with investment banking? How much more would they need to learn and what is the reason they may not be favorable? Yeah, so I think, well, kind of start with this and um, obviously Luis, Dr. Luis and uh, Francisco will chip in. Uh, I don't think, uh, so investment banking is such a large um, kind of term uh, and there are many, many areas where actuaries can actually slot into. Uh, I don't think, you know, there is kind of a, a hit, well, obviously there's some roles that are naturally more, Align with what actually is going to do, so risk management, kind of the modeling uh, side of things. But I don't think that is in itself a just the kind of the end of, of that kind of equation. There are, you know, there are a number of actuaries are in the banking uh, sector, you know, covering different things, you know, equity uh, research roles, uh, fixed income sales role, uh, I know trading as well. So, uh, that, you know, it's coming back to what was kind of said in this presentation already, it's down to you as an individual to use the platform that you've gained, the, the knowledge that you've gained to, to kind of pursue the roles that you want to uh, pursue. I, I don't really have anything to add on that. Okay, we can move on to the next question. The next question is from James. James is asking, how is the role of the actuary going to change in the next few years? For example, due to COVID-19, Brexit, and emerging technologies. I can uh, maybe speak about that. Um, I, I don't think any of this Brexit, COVID, or anything are any different from what we've lived in the past 10 years in the sense of they would impact the role of an actuary differently. Um, the role of an actuary is whatever you want, whatever actuaries want to do with it. Uh, as someone, as people who have a you know good skill set in risk management, measurement, and uh, you know some financial knowledge as well, it's whatever you want to do with it. Now, I would say one area that probably is going to be slightly different is 
in the past 15, 20 years, the world was moving towards a larger degree of globalization. And I think not just Brexit, but also COVID and all these other events that are happening worldwide tend to make it a little bit of a less uh, global one. So probably the role of the archery will change with that. And just to give you a specific example, in my case, I've spent a lot of my time trying to understand and make you know most sense of solvency too. Uh, Brexit, to an extent, is going to bring a new set of rules, probably very similar to solvency two, but it's still sufficiently different uh, or different enough for me to have to learn one more thing. Well, if that happened in every single country, I would have basically to spend my entire life just relearning everything because there's not going to be one single rule, but a lot of them. So this is the, the type of uh, consequence that that I would say uh, is going to happen with the view that the world is going to be a little bit less globalized. Probably there is going to be uh, fewer big areas of work and a lot of smaller areas of work. And that's obviously an opportunity for those who are interested in developing those. I'm, I hope that actuaries will apply their skills in areas outside their traditional domains. I think we have a lot to offer in the way we think about risk and that we need to step back. One of the things we're good at or we should be good at is thinking about implications that's kind of what, what we do about risk. We say, well, if, if such and such, such happens, what might the implications be? And the world desperately needs to think about medium and long-term implications of short-term actions. And that's becoming, I think, in, increasingly obvious to a number of people. And that's something that actuaries should be really good at. Um, so I would like to see us moving into those sorts of things and, and using our skills to help make the world a better place. Okay, so we can move on to the next question. The next question is from Chalani. Chalani is asking, what kind of work ethic do you need to have to be able to work while completing actuarial exams? And does it differ a lot to compare to, to a traditional job? Well, um, Francis and Francisco are much closer to the actuarial exams than I am. Um, from right. my own experience, um, time management is, is the most important thing. You, 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 you have to organize your time effectively. Yeah, I can, I can agree more. Um, I think uh, you will need to have a level of dedication uh, to kind of pursue the exams and, you know, uh, work, progress and work at the same time. The exams are no mean feat, right? You know, it takes a lot of dedication and learning to, uh, to go through the exams and every actually will go through that process. Um, so yeah, you definitely need a kind of good work ethic. Uh, but I think the good news is that you will be able to find applications of your study into work. We makes the kind of the learning much easier and you can then immediately see beyond just the numbers and the formulas on your sheet to, you know, real life applications. Um, so, but yeah, to answer the question head on. Yes, good work ethic is a minimum requirement. Okay, so we have another question. The next question is from Sham. Sham is asking, in general, how is the work life balance of an actuary? Uh, I, I don't think there is a general answer to that question. I think it, it can vary a lot from employer to employer. Um, one, one thing that I would say is the nature of the actuarial work is not one that changes overnight. We're talking about uh, most of the work that most actuaries do, regardless of the field. It tends to be on uh, topics that are that change 
relatively slowly, which uh, makes uh, the nature of the work a lot easier to handle than in areas where things change very quickly. So even in my case, and I, I wonder maybe Francis can also relate to this, but I work in the financial markets. Financial markets change very quickly. Yes, that could make my work very stressful, but the reality is that the work that I do within financial markets is on risks that change not that quickly. Therefore, it gives me a lot of time to plan. So bottom line, I can get a, an okay life work balance by pacing myself and focusing on the long term and a little bit less on the very volatile short term. Um, and probably I'm, I'm speaking from the experience of someone who is working in the fastest paced part of the actuarial industry. Yeah, I can, can agree more uh, spot on there. Okay, we can now move on to the next question. The next question is from Noor Wulan. Noor is asking which industry should actuaries work on more in developing countries such as Indonesia? I suspect it's going to vary between countries. Um, one of the things about developing countries is that um, typically in those countries, the insurance industry is relatively immature. So there's huge scope for the insurance industry to expand. Um, and you'll find that the characteristics of, of the insurance industries in, in different countries are really quite different. Um, so for example, the life insurance industry in developing countries seems to be focused much more on um, providing protection in, uh, insurance, whereas in the UK, it's, it's focused much more on, on providing um, sort of financial security through investment. So that's a big difference. Um, so typically, in developing countries, I think most actuaries would be working in the insurance industry, but increasingly we're seeing them working in, in banking too. And it's really all about the expansion of the financial services industries in those countries. And, and the pattern of that varies a lot between countries, so it, you, you can't generalize too much. Uh, I would add to that. Um, it, I don't have any first-hand experience working in emerging countries, but uh, uh, during my time as editor of the Actuary magazine, I, I got the opportunity to talk with a lot of actuaries who do work in emerging countries. And one thing that really resonates from those conversations is that when you're in London, in New York, in Tokyo, an actuary is generally very specialized. So, you know, you work in investments, you work in investments, you work in pensions, you work in pensions, and there, there is some permeability, but people are generally specialized. I've learned on the other end uh, from someone who has done a lot of work in Africa, an actuary is an actuary. There's no investments or life. You have to be able to change hats very quickly and be able to answer questions and do work regardless of where it's coming from. So probably depending on where you are in the world, you should look around and see what degree of specialization you need, because maybe you're highly specialized in a market that requires general knowledge or vice versa. So that's, a, that's probably an important angle to think about. That's a really important point, actually, which is fantastic because it gives you the opportunity to do lots of different things, learn new stuff and apply your skills in new ways. So in the UK, a lot of, that, a lot of mainstream actuarial work is, is um, it would be wrong to say it's doing the same old thing, but it's, it's very um, constrained in that, you know, you're working on a, on, on a, on a particular project that's been done and, you know, done, done before and in, in, in huge, well-established organizations, but in emerging countries, things are much, much more fluid and, and you can go, I mean, in um, Kenya, for example, we have a number of actuaries who are working in, in the mobile money field which is just really exciting and, and you know, fantastic. Um, so all sorts of opportunities. 
Okay, now we will move on to the next question. The question is about the actuarial exams from Kenneth and Ayesha. They're asking, are there any firms out there that sponsors both IFOA and CFA qualification for their employees? And how do you prepare for an IFOA exam? Yeah, I would say most, uh, most employers actually tend to sponsor to an extent. Uh, uh, you know, some are more generous than others. Um, if uh, they do it by typically by providing uh, financial support, so basically paying for the exams. And uh, some are generous enough also to provide study time. I think the consultants tend to be pretty good at that. Um, I would say if an employer, and this is, this is a very personal view, if I were to go back and an employer didn't facilitate for me to get trained, either by providing the training or by providing the time to do the training, I would say it's better to move away from that employer because in the long term, that is not going to be a good place for you to be in. Um, you know, the, you need to develop your career. And if, if you are trapped in a place that doesn't give you the time or the support to do it, best to move out. Yeah, I guess from someone who's kind of done both, uh, you know, I was very fortunate in the, in the sense that um, GLT was very happy to sponsor the time uh, for both the the exams. Obviously, it takes out a lot in terms of you know the time that you need to study and also to sit for the exam. Uh, so, kind of echoing what Francisco said, you need to be able to find an employer that is supportive in that sense. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, without kind of generalizing, you know, many firms will offer you that support, but it the question is not kind of set in stone. It, it kind of is fluid as well, and really depends on personal circumstances. Uh, but I guess the yeah the the summary here is that yeah you will be able to find many firms that kind of at least offers you uh, a base level of support. And then how to maybe the, well, there was a second question how do you prepare for the uh, the IFO exam? Uh, I, I think there are many sort of synergies that you can apply from your current studying in university to the um, the exam. You know it's. Uh, it's a certain kind of preparation and goal that you need to to uh, to prepare for. Uh, you will find the challenges of working and studying uh, at the same time. But you know, as I guess a, a graduate, you will find different challenges as well. So I don't think it's too different. Okay, now we have a question that is quite different, but I think it speaks to a lot of students that might have experienced this as well. So this is a question from Aliyah. Aliyah is asking that often as a student, she stumbled into loopholes of giving up and find it hard to bring herself up again and continue her journey of becoming an actuary. So she was wondering if any of the speakers have an experience in this kind of stuff as well. And if so, what motivates and encourages to keep on working towards their goal? Well, that's a, I think that happens to students, to uh, people who do sports or anyone who is doing something that is, uh, you know, he heavy lifting. Um, I, 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 something that Francis said earlier, to, it really resonated with me, that when you are um, studying something, you're reading books, papers, spending time, you know, doing some intellectual activity on something, but at the same time, you're working on it and you can see the practical side of it it makes it really much more interesting and uh, easier to grasp as well um, it, because it gets you personally involved. So generally, if it's something that you can uh, find a, a use for, so what you're studying is something that you can directly apply to your work, to your life, to your, you know, whatever you're doing, I think that that definitely is makes life uh, or makes students' life a lot easier. But um, ultimately, it's about loving what you do if, if if you do not love what you do and it's it's painful if it's you know too much probably it's worth at this stage maybe trying to finish it as good as you can or if it's really far away from finishing uh if you're really far away from finishing it maybe rethinking about it yeah kind of, yeah kind of, kind of agree more i think uh it's you know the exams are challenging you know that's uh, kind of given so uh, setbacks are part and parcel of the journey 
but it is a journey. Uh, like I said, you know, becoming an actuary, uh, it's not the destination. It gives you the platform to do other things. So if you can look through the short-term pain and look at the longer-term gain, uh, I always find that kind of helps. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. So this question is from Yap Ting Swen. He is asking, is the demand of actuary always high? but will there ever be a satisfaction or saturation level for actuaries? I hope not. Um, there will be if we don't adapt to the changing world. If we keep doing exactly what we're doing now, the world will move on and there won't be a demand for us. There's no way I could get a job now with only the skills that I learned in my actuarial exams 35 years ago. Of course not. I've had to learn so much since then. Um, so if we can, this is really important that the, the world isn't stationary, so we can't be stationary either, but we can um, move with the world, preferably slightly ahead of it so that we can grasp opportunities and um, that in, if we are like that, if we have a, an open mindset, if we're always interested in learning new things and learning new skills, yes, there'll be a demand for us. Yeah, I can, I can, can I echo what uh, Dr. Lewis has uh, said, you know, uh, I think the skill set of an actuary is not one that you just fit into this box and then, you know, it's just that box. It's huge range, you know, you know, the example of, you know, uh, the uh, colleagues in Kenya doing, you know, digital currency, the examples of colleagues who are uh, in, you know, other parts of industries are doing different things. So, um, yeah, the, the world is really your oyster. Uh, but, you know, you need to be able to understand and adapt to the changing uh, conditions. Yeah, 100% agree with what has been said. I think, I don't know if the demand for actuaries will be... Uh, will continue or not. But what I know is that the demand for intelligent, hardworking people will continue to, to, to be there. And uh, becoming an actuary requires some degree of intelligence and definitely a, a fair amount of hard work. So uh, using that as a proxy, I, I would say most likely the demand will continue be it in traditional fields or less traditional fields, but for sure there will be some demand for intelligent, hardworking people. Thank you so much. That marks the end of our general Q&A session. Thank you students and thank you speakers for joining our session today. I am sure that every student here in this virtual conference has found somewhere new where our studies can take us. Certainly actuaries work across the sectors and we are so genuinely excited to see where our careers, where we will all end up. So this marks the end of session one, actuaries as an expanding career. Before we end the first session, I invite everyone to turn on their cameras for a photo session. Okay, great. I'll wait for a few moments more. Okay, we will start taking the picture. I will count down for five. Everybody get ready. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, thank you everyone. So please scan the QR code and fill up the form to mark your attendance and stand a chance to be one of the three lucky winners to win a £10 Amazon e-voucher. Just to clarify, attending a session gives you one entry. So attending both sessions doubles your, doubles your chance to win. The three lucky winners will be announced live at the end of session two. Thank you to all of you who took time off of your busy schedule to attend our event. And to those who registered for session two, See you later.